Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. You already know what time it is. This is certified uh, brand new year, brand new episode. I got a really awesome guest with me today. I'm um, talking about Roxanne Hayward. Uh, if you've paid attention to DCXIV over the years, she was actually, when we first launched DCXIV back in 2014, she was actually one of my first uh, interviews that we did on the website. So put the show notes in there and you can uh, take a look at that later. Um, but for everybody brand new, welcome Roxanne. Thank you so much for doing the show. Hey, Mike, thank you for having me. This is so fun. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's my pleasure. Thank you for being the first guest of 2021. Oh, yeah. Um, try, trying to, yep, yeah, there you go. Trying to kick <laughs> this year off with a bang. Uh, you've been busy, though. Uh, when we first met up with you, uh, I say met up, interview and writing, uh, mm -hmm. you had just gotten done doing, uh, what was it, uh, The Inferno? Um, yeah, was that Death Race? That was yeah, Death Race Inferno. A while ago. <laughs> you were Prudence in Death Race Inferno. Correct. And, Good memory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, after looking over your career over the last few years, that was such a departure from almost everything you've done. You've done, you know, Leonardo, and you've done some of these BBC pieces, and you've done some of these other uh, kind of like period type style uh, movies and television shows. Yeah. What was, I mean, we'll get to all of that, but what was Death Race like? Because that was just like so different from everything <laughs> else you do. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, it's, it's funny you say that. I mean, you know, studying theatre, because that was what my training was in. I always loved the idea of these period pieces and the beautiful dresses. And I don't know if you, it feels like the whole world's been watching Bridgerton right now, but that kind of, on Netflix, that kind of very like pretty beautiful storyline. Um, and we had death race coming to shoot in South Africa and it was like kind of the talk of the town for a lot of the actors in South Africa. Um, cause it was this big international production universal pictures was producing it. So all the casting directors, all the casting agents, the acting agents, they were all talking about it. All the actors were talking about it and I had an audition for it, um, which I was super excited about. And I think, how old was I? I think I was 19 at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I remember you were super um, young. Yeah, I was little. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're still so, super young, but. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, you're flattering me. But um, yeah, I, I just finished doing Beaver Falls, which was BBC, which was also as a South African international production, which was exciting. And now there was this American production, Beaver Falls was British, uh, moved on to Death Race, which was American. And it was super exciting because I booked a role in it. Um, and yeah, it was not a period piece with pretty corsets and hairdos. It was this <laughs> wild, fast cars, apocalyptic, yeah. exactly explosions. Um, but so much fun, so much fun. And I'm almost, I'm so happy that I was part of that because it really made me go, wow, you know, like I think it's welcome good to, to Hollywood, have, right? <laughs> yeah, welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> Before you even moved out here, out to the states, welcome to Hollywood. For sure. Little did I know I'd be moving there. How many years later? Eight years later. <laughs> well, so, I mean, you know, they say if you want to really make a career in this business, eventually you got to go to New York or Hollywood. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many, say, many and actors and actresses that, you know, still reside in places like South Africa or places like the UK or, you know, wherever they're from. Um, but yeah, yeah, to, especially to make it to get your name in this business unfortunately yeah. Hollywood's still home so yeah and you kind of want I mean part of the reason that I decided to move out here was I wanted I really wanted consistency in my career and I just wanted to work a little bit more consistently because in South Africa it's great I love South Africa I love South Africans I mean well it's my home you know that's where I grew up and um was born and I just missed working all the time because there are some dry spells and it's kind of dependent on the weather so if it starts yeah. raining if then it's the industry kind of goes on a little um break little hiatus. Especially, yeah especially all the international production shooting there because they're like why would we fly all the way to south africa to shoot in the rain i gotta imagine too you're talking about being what 19 doing a movie with luke goss ving rames danny treo um just a, a list of like people that have had so much experience in mm -hmm. uh, Hollywood, in movies. I mean, it's definitely gotta be a good learning experience too, even though that's not really, you know, like you said, what, what you normally do, but it's definitely gotta be a learning experience, learning from some people like that. Definitely. I mean, from 
they were just such seasoned and they just they are such seasoned film actors and they Danny Trejo is like one of the nicest people oh uh, he's uh, do you know him or have you heard of like have you chatted I've to met him? him briefly oh yeah you have but, but I know so many people out there in LA you know he has so many businesses he has out there in LA as well not mm-hmm. just acting like he has a lot of side businesses and anybody yeah. who's interacted with him first words out of his mouth like Forget his past. Forget everything you know about what you think you see him on TV screens. Mm-hmm. The man now is one of the nicest people you could ever meet. He would give he, the shirt off his back for you. He would, yeah. Yeah, it's so funny you say that because that's mm-hmm. one of the. Ma- I mean, I'm really having to rack my memory because <laughs> this was so long ago. The shoot, the yeah. film, but um, but out of all the memories from that shoot, that's one of the fondest was working with Danny Trejo. He really as you said, just what a nice guy. And he, I mean, I was this young South African girl on set, had, didn't have a lot of film credits to my name. You know, he, we didn't really have, I don't think we had one scene together. I think we did the table read um, before shooting with all the cast and the production side and the director, Raul Rene, and we met then. And then we'd cross paths every now and then um, at base camp where we were shooting. and. He didn't have to interact with me or talk to me, but he made me feel so like welcome to the production because this was also the sequel. This was um, the third death race. Yeah. Yeah. So he just made me feel like part of the family and what an, like, really, really, what a nice guy. And it's funny you mentioned that it was a sequel because I I obviously found youth from there and like I was interviewing a lot of people at the time and. I love giving throughout my entire career. I've loved giving a spotlight to people who are on the rise or brand new to the industry or that, you know, deserve to get a chance to to be seen. And I saw what you did in the movie. I thought you were awesome in the movie. So I was like, Hey, let me reach out and see if she wants to do it. And of course you did. And it turned out awesome. Uh, but yeah, like I was a big fan of the franchise, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to call it a B movie series, but it's kind of like one of those, those, action movies that might not have the best plot but it has a lot of people that you know in it so it's yeah. worth watching and as a guy it's like everything's going boom 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 everything's <laughs> exploding and so i always had a lot of fun with the death races i was the last one i think i actually watched i think they came out with one more i still haven't seen but i, I um, think they did i think there was a fourth one after that and i only know that because i think i heard they're working on a fifth one now oh no way i didn't know that <laughs> yeah um, yeah yeah, I was yeah. going through my internet movie database, like pro account, and I'm like, wait, what? Another what? It's Another one of those things that's in production, but with 2020 and now 2021, you know, firsthand how how some of those productions are getting pushed back or canceled or delayed or whatever. So yes, I know all about all about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, definitely it's one of those guilty pleasure kind of films. So you can just like press play and kind of like zone out and just enjoy a good action movie. <laughs> Yeah, I've had, I've had Alan Z on, I've had Donovan Carter on, a couple other guys who, who have uh, some acting stuff, and they just both, they say the same thing. Mm-hmm. One's actually starting to get a lot of audition stuff, and the other one's still, like, playing a waiting game. Um, yeah. Or, then, I mean, you know, what happened to me, so I moved to the U.S. end of 2018, mm-hmm. um, really the end of 2018, and then it was Christmas and New Year's. My mom actually came from South Africa, and we had nice. a great, like, first month together that was Fun. We went to Vegas for New Year's. We're like, woohoo, we're doing like New Year's American style. <laughs> it's 2018. Um, that was or now. That was the New Year's of 2019. So okay. the end of 2018 going and yeah. Like, it's kind of kind of dangerous now. But then Yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> but um yeah, and then 2019 was great. It was like a really good, I call it my teething year, you know, moving to the US, immigrating, learning to drive on the other side of the road, learning the difference between Fahrenheit and Celsius and <laughs> all those goodies <laughs> Yards and then and, um, and, and feet and exactly i mean oh why do we make miles and kilometers it's like we both speak english but so often i feel like we're speaking different languages because i'm like i don't know what there's america saying. and there's everything else exactly it's like yeah exactly <laughs> we separated from the british empire and we're like what do they do no we're not doing that no. exactly yeah we're doing something else the opposite. just because just because we can um so, makes sense 250 years later then everybody was probably really confused exactly right it's very, Y'all it's very still, people coming over here are still confused now imagine imagine then yeah exactly i know there was no google to reference yeah you you like all those period pieces oh, imagine some of those people that were alive then they're like wait 
Wait, what? What? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. Vegas. <laughs> 2019 ringing in the year. So, yeah, no, so just to say 2019 was a year of kind of building up the momentum. I got a great, my manager who I actually um, signed with before I officially moved here, um, he, you know, stuck with me and really like introduced me to some fantastic theatrical agents, commercial agents, print agents. I kind of developed this really great team. I started working on some exciting projects, especially on the commercial side, like some really great national campaigns. And, you know, so it was, it was great. I was like, okay, I'm kind of getting the hang of it. This is great. 2020, 2020 is going to be like the year. It's going to start. I mean, in fairness, in fairness, everyone said that, especially everyone. being a nice round number. 2020 it was a new decade. Exactly. And you know, 22, like the number 22, not that I'm superstitious, but I've always got, oh, if I had a lucky number, it would be 22 because it's so pretty. It's like two little two twos. It's just such a round not, nice round number. So 2020, I was like, this is going to be my year. It's going to be. You know, just a, let's do it now. Teething pain's gone. And then we all know what happened. But um, a lot of it, like, as you said, you're either waiting. Still for, happening. It's still happening. Or, like, I booked some really exciting jobs that I was really, you know, thrilled to be working on. And they've just kind of been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And the first one was supposed to start shooting in March. Then the lockdown started. It got pushed to June. We were all like, oh, give it two weeks till this little what's it called? Coronavirus thing blows over, you know, two weeks later, we were like, Oh, maybe give it another two weeks, another two weeks. So it's, um, it was definitely a year of learning how to adapt and how to pivot. And was that was one of those after the horizon? Um, yeah, that was one of them. That was so that one we were actually looking Yeah, doing. I, I saw that you had that one in development. And I was just like, hmm. like pre production, will it ever see? <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, I mean, that one I'm really dying to work on. It's such a beautiful screenplay. Oh, it's really a gorgeous, gorgeous screenplay written by Marcus Redmond. And we wanted to shoot that back in South Africa. And they started getting the ball rolling with all the line producers in South Africa. And the role is just so lovely as well. The storyline's beautiful. It's something everyone can relate to. It's really like, um, no matter where you're from, what country you're from, you know, you can just relate to the universal story. And um, that's been pushed, especially with international travel. I mean, it's all it's set in South Africa, um, so it's uh, it's just all. So you'd have to go home for that one for a while. I'd have to go home. I don't mind seeing my family. I haven't seen them for over a year now. It's like that that seems to be the story. I know a few people, especially a couple that are uh, Eastern European, and like they they've been dying to get back and get home because it used to be like they didn't want to leave because U.S. has some of these six month restrictions where you can come for six months. And, stay, and then you got to leave for six months or if you stay for two years. But then if you, you exceed that, then you, you if you go back, you might not be able to get back in. Like there, there's a lot of visa travel issues that so a lot of people that come over here, especially if they're working or doing whatever, they don't necessarily want to, to risk going back. But now after COVID yeah. and everything else, they're just dying to get back because they can't see their families. They can't see everybody that they, you know, are de- near and dear to them. So mm-hmm. it's definitely become an issue. Yeah, definitely. And I, I I can definitely relate to that. It's, you know, I've got the security, I've got my green card. So that's kind of like, phew, but part of me goes, oh, I'm, st- I'm still not a citizen. So what if, you know, I know in South Africa, they closed, I think now, not I think now, I know now international travels open again in South Africa. So that's great. Especially but it's not Africa. open everywhere. That's the problem. It's not open everywhere. But at some stage, they did have it closed off to people who weren't citizens so you could only enter the country as a citizen yeah. and I mean what if the same thing happens in America you know like I live here now <laughs> this is where my life is now so um I mean yeah, we went so through that like, firsthand my wife's family's all Peruvian oh really oh wow about two weeks before everything kind of went crazy like they went home to celebrate a birthday in Peru and after about a week or so, a lot of things started getting shut down, both here and abroad. And then Peru shut down their borders. And everybody basically had like 12 hours to get to the airport and get out. And in the process, they live in a small village up by Ica in Peru, but it's not, you're not going to get, like, you may make it in 12 hours, but you got to really haul, like, you got to get there. And 
of course, they couldn't get to the airport in time, didn't really know what was going on. The government didn't give them a lot of instructions. They were just saying, hey, if you want to get out, get your flight now, you got to go. And then, of course, it became like, I want to say, like, maybe like a two week long battle with the embassy and State Department and everyone else trying to get them out and get them back to the United States because their their home is here now. They're, they're yeah. citizens here now. They're they raise multiple generations here now. But, you know, Peru is still always going to be their home. But mm-hmm. this is where they live now. And to try to get them back was such a nightmare with all the travel, the restrictions. Yeah, yeah it's. See, like you hear a story like that and it kind of makes you go, oh, maybe I'll wait a little bit till I go back home to South Africa. And I'll bring this up because I know you're big into Muay Thai and we'll definitely talk about that. Um, One of the other shows I do, Art of MMA, we talk about that all the time because a lot of fighters can't get to uh, some that are signed with a promotion called 1FC. Mm -hmm. have a lot of stuff in, in China and Japan and they're not bringing in a lot of United States fighters right now because those governments don't want us bringing COVID to them. Mm-hmm. So that's yeah. a, that's an issue too. Um, a lot yeah. of governments don't want, you know, the, the Americans with the massive spread right now, <laughs> to like to bring it to their country. So it, going it goes both ways. And it's just, I really can't wait till, and I, I don't know if I'm always pro vaccine, but this time I, I don't <laughs> care if it gives me a third leg, just go ahead and just, just <laughs> give me the vaccine so we can start somewhat getting back to our lives. And it, yeah, it's so true. It's so true. I think, you know, it's the beginning of the year, as you said, like we want to start the year with a bang and we really want to, I don't know, be optimistic or, you know, positive or look on the bright side, find the silver lining. Um, Yeah. New Year's resolutions, New Year's, new hope. Yeah. I I haven't even thought of a resolution this year. Not this year. (laughs) I'm surviving. Yeah, not this year. (laughs) One day at a time. But um, yeah, I forgot about that. Thanks for the reminder. (laughs) But um. I think everyone who made it through 2020, just that people can be so proud of themselves for making it through and adjusting to their circumstances. Cause you know, life will always, this is, this is how I look at it and how I had been looking at it throughout the year of 2020, which kind of got me through mentally and emotionally is I was like, this is a horrible circumstance. It's a horrible circumstance for me. It's a horrible circumstance for everyone. Could my circumstance be worse? Yes, it could be way worse. Like, you know, there are people who have had terrible circumstance, even worse, you know, the implications have been even worse for them. So the circumstances are not great. However, life will always present circumstances to you. Sometimes they'll be great and sometimes they won't be great. So how do you kind of, how do you adapt to it? Or how do you just make little adjustments in order to survive, you know, in order to just get through? Um, and really like I take my hat off to everyone who's been able to do that and just kind of make it through 2020. Cause it's, I think we only need, we need to acknowledge that, you know, acknowledge that of ourselves, like really take a step back, be proud, be like, well done. Like, you know, yeah, I've noticed that you've definitely, and, uh, looking through all your material and stuff online right now, I've noticed you've definitely embraced that this year. Like you've, you've taken time, you've been all about self-motivation, caring, uh, growing positivity. Uh, you just launched a podcast. There, there's so many things that you could do. Um, if you've noticed this year, we, we brought my show back from the dead. Yeah. Um, I feel like if you're not taking time to do something, whether it's learn a skill, uh, learn a craft, train in something, just become better somehow. And all this time that we have alone, not just sit back and, and binge watch on Netflix, which I do that too, but, <laughs> but it, it's, you know, it, guilty. <laughs> shout out to Cobra Kai. Awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just finished season three. I'm really pissed at the <laughs> ending, but we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, it's one of those things that you have this terrible thing that's happening in the world, but you have an opportunity. And I think you're one of the people that really have kind of embraced it because like you said in uh, on one of your websites, it might even be yours, but I noticed you sent me links to a few things. So, but, and I'll put show notes on the show notes. I'll put links to everything that you sent me, but you had this chance to turn a negative into a positive and you had a chance to, instead of just being trapped in the house and doing nothing, you started a podcast, you've been doing, you continue your training, obviously virtually, but I'm sure you can't wait to get back in the gym or, or have they opened the gyms there yet? No, they have not. I mean, the, the place I train Muay Thai in LA um 
miraculously, they found this incredible location. What do they call it? The compound. It's like, it feels like you're on a campus, like a university campus almost. And it's got all these outdoor fields. So they are actually, or outdoor courts. And they've converted those courts. They've brought the mats in for everyone to do jujitsu and train Muay Thai safely in an outdoor environment. So That's they've, really cool. um, yeah, they've, they've managed to adapt as we were saying, but, um, but yeah, I haven't, I'm still, you know, being careful, being cautious, doing a lot I'm of- I'm the same way. I went to the gym one time and uh, about a month ago and I saw some things and I was just like, I can't, I can't. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I got to lose some of this COVID weight too. But, but <laughs> I, I was like, I can't, like, I just, no, nah, I'll just take my chances working out outside and doing some stuff, but. Yeah. And it's amazing. It's like, we can't, I've never been one to work out on my own. It's not been an interest of mine at all. I love when I started Muay Thai, I want to say it's nearly six years ago now, five or six years ago. Um, I started that with Quinton Chong back in South Africa. Uh, it was like, the feeling of camaraderie, you know, you've got someone holding pads for you and then you switch and then you hold pads for someone. And you're like, one, two, one, two. And you're like, no, push harder, push harder. It's like, it's just such an energizing thing. You're not even thinking about how exhausted you are, how tired you are. You just like push through because you've got this, your whole class or your partner like pushing you on. hundred percent. So it, it might be an individual accomplishment, but it's still a team sport. You know, exactly, I said that yeah, yeah. like when all these MMA guys I'm working with and stuff, you know, one of the things they miss the most and some in like New York, New Jersey are kind of like getting back into the gym and it's, it's, you know, it's different now. It's, you know, social distance. It's, it's all these rules and regulations, but they're start, starting to get back into the gyms and it's one of those things like they just missed the camaraderie, the, the mm -hmm. motivation, you know, you go in a gym and you can work out by yourself all day long, mm -hmm. but if you have somebody pushing you, you go twice as hard. And that's just like in any sport, in any uh, competitive nature, yeah. even in acting, I'm sure like, when you're sitting there on set and you mess up a line, I just saw the Fresh Prince reunion not long ago. Oh, and Will yeah? Smith was talking about like the scene, famous scene he had with James Avery and where he like one of the emotional scenes and he just messed it up and messed it up. And James Avery just like yelled at him and snapped him out of it. And then Will had like the greatest scene in the history of the show. And James pulled him close and he's like, now that's acting. And it was that motivation from somebody else. Yeah that really got him over the hump. And it's like yeah. that in Muay Thai, it's like that in life, you know? Yeah, it's so true, right? It's really true. It's, and it's so interesting that you say that, linking back to what you said beforehand, like making it through the year. It's a segue. So how did, <laughs> what's that? I said it's a segue. <laughs> exactly, it's a segue, beautiful, very poetic. It's a good metaphor, um, but it is, it's kind of, we need those people to cheer us on in life in martial arts in the acting side you know having so this year I've kind of gone how can I I can sit back and wait for someone to cheer me on you know I can I can be the one going I need someone to cheer me on like you know I'm feeling so despondent like there's no work oh my gosh there's no work I've immigrated to the other side of the world it's like a completely different time zone to all my family um and what like there's nothing happening you know I need I need people to like look after me or care for me or cheer me on that could have been the one route that I took but then I went hang on a second if I'm feeling like this but I've still got a roof over my head or I've still got money you know in the bank to be able to go and buy groceries yeah and other people who don't have that can I be that person to cheer other people on and so I just kind of went, the way that I'm going to get through this is I'm going to like not be stuck in my head and not, because sometimes we can get so bogged down. I know this personally, like we can get so bogged down thinking about everything that's wrong in our life or thinking about everything, how everything should be, as opposed to how it actually is. It's like, it should be like this. Well, you know what? It's not. So yes, we can sit and really focus on that. For me, the way that I managed to get out of my head was not with like self-care or like self-motivation. It was actually just, you know what? There's nothing I can do about my circumstance. How can I help other people in their circumstances? Or how can I place my focus on other people? And it was almost this beautiful thing because through helping other people, they kind of felt better, but so did I. <laughs> so it was almost a little bit selfish, but yeah. it really got me out of my head. And before I knew it, I was like, heck on, 2020, like, although it's been a really tough year, I've actually grown. Helping people always helps you feel better too. 
It really does, right? So it's just, um, and that's kind of how I survived 2020 was placing my focus on others. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, when you when you do stuff like that, no matter what, whether it's helping one person, you can't help everyone. We all know that. But, mm-hmm. you know, you, you help one person, help somebody else, and you pay it forward sometimes. And it just, yeah, yeah it's kind of like a unintended, like extra bonus, I guess. But normally you feel pretty good about yourself when you help somebody else. So yeah. I definitely I definitely respect what you're doing. Um, yeah. And before we get into some of that, because I don't want to get too sidetracked off, off of some of your acting. Some of those period pieces you did, right? Mm-hmm. For one, I'm a huge Leonardo da Vinci fan. So I actually did watch some of that BBC thing uh, back, yeah. I guess it's almost a decade ago. Um, I wasn't much as a fan of that one as a, another fictitious series that came out shortly after named Da Vinci's Demons. I, I love that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was on Stars. That, that was actually one of my favorites because... The show you were on, Leonardo, on BBC, was, it had a story to it, but it just wasn't as action. Like, it it, it was kind of more like a drama to me. Mm-hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like more yeah. like a period piece drama. Um, and it had a cool little story to it, and it was a little different. It was fictitious, obviously. Yeah. Um, I find most people, when you talk about Leonardo da Vinci, I don't think most people understand most of the stories that come out are fictitious about him, because they're really... It really wasn't as much as people think knowing about the man himself. You know about all his work. You know about, and I'm a big history buff. You know about all his work. You know about who he's worked for and what he's been around and what he invented. But there's so many stories and legends and myths and other things that go and rumors about, you know, everything from his, the way he lived, his sexuality to his his relationships to who he knew, what he knew. Um, and some have made him like bigger than life, which, you know, more power to him. I think everybody in death sometimes tends to get elevated. I mean, Elvis Presley, Tupac, like you want to do some more modern. Yeah. References. Um, kind of hard to see behind me, but I got a Funko Pop of Biggie. Like, it, oh, yeah, it, yeah. When you, when you kind of like, they people come larger than life after, after their death, if they were somewhat famous before they died. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but Leonardo, like he's always been one of the most interesting characters in all of history from yeah. all of his inventions and everything. When you do a piece like that, see, I'll, find, I'll eventually come back to a question. <laughs> when, when you do a piece <laughs> like that, are you just acting or do you get kind of involved in the whole scene? Like, do you get, like, do you care more about someone like Leonardo da Vinci or do you just kind of go and treat it as a job? Good question. So it's um because you were super young then too you were younger than death race yeah wait was that first was that before death race or after death race you probably know better than me i like, believe so according <laughs> yeah i think it was a year before death race oh wow okay okay that makes sense so um yeah with leonardo i was super excited because as i said it was the period piece and the beautiful costumes oh my gosh i felt like a princess every day on set i had I couldn't get into my wardrobe by myself. So I did have three dresses helping me put the corsets on under this, you know, like they would have done back in that day. And I had two ladies beautifully doing the most incredible hair designs. The one woman was called, her name was Vera. I cannot remember her surname, but incredible artistry with how she designed um, my hair for the different scenes. And it was just this beautiful preparation leading into the day's work, you know, stepping back. Um, in time and part of it goes yes you create my character um, Angelica Visconti was a fictional character she didn't actually exist um, but you do want to give justice to the period was that one and- of those characters though where it wasn't a real character but it was maybe a combination of of several other maybe real life characters or was it just completely made from scratch well, I think definitely, I think she was completely made from scratch. There was a Visconti family at the time. Um, and I think her circumstance was definitely one that was, you was know. plausible, but maybe not really. Plausible, definitely. Like, you know, an arranged marriage and her family having to pay a dowry um, for her to marry into the um, Medici family. But those characters did, the other characters did exist. So Machiavelli, um, yeah. the Medici family, Leonardo. 
So you do want to give justice to the period and you also want to give justice to those characters, even though, as you said, it's fiction and it was a hybrid as well, which made it quite fun. So there were a few like modern elements thrown in, like Leonardo's running around the streets um, of Italy wearing um, all stars kind of thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, there was that kind of nice twist to it, which kept it fun and fresh and maybe a little bit more relatable for viewers um, and quirky. But yeah, you definitely want to, you want to highlight as much of that period as possible uh, while still crafting a character, you know, and still having the creative side of it, like make, you know, bringing this character that, um, you know, didn't actually exist to life. Did you have any kind of uh, background knowledge on someone like Leonardo da Vinci before you started this? So like you, I really, really enjoy history. And it's um, it was a subject I did through high school, all the way through high school. Um, although we covered Leonardo back in junior school, <laughs> Leonardo yeah, da sure. Vinci. And that was kind of, so I had to rack my brain. But he is referenced in everyday modern life. If you look, you know, you don't even have to look too far. He is like a helicopter he invented the first helicopter um there's so many of his inventions that are carried through um to our life now in modern day times so and then also his artwork as well i love i paint um and 2020 was also a great year i was able to get i'm sure the solitude probably you came up with a bunch of work yeah (laughs) so um yeah every little minute i was like oh no okay i'll watch netflix later when the sun goes down that'll be my I binge watching time when the sun's up i've got to like do a little bit of work here and there um so i started the painting again but that side of um, welcome to my world loved yeah i was like are you the same same kind of schedule well, I, I have a little girl so um ah, i say good. little she's 12 now but oh it, my goodness yeah it's about to be a nightmare but <laughs> but yeah when when that's when i get my quiet time is mm-hmm. like after hours and then i can really focus whether i'm doing web design whether i'm doing editing whether i'm doing research whether i'm just goofing off and watching netflix yeah that's normally that's that's the time yeah um yeah it's funny it's, it's funny because i actually always used to be more of a nocturnal kind of creative so it's like nighttime was when my creative side came out i don't know what it is and i don't know if it's now because of daylight saving as well when the sun goes down i'm like okay i'm ready for dinner and i'm ready to like after dinner watch an episode of something and then snuggle up into bed <laughs> Um, it's kind of weird how that works right like you you see a lot of creatives that are either completely nocturnal and they'll be up all night and sleep all day or you see some that are like crack of dawn the sun is up i want to do something creative but you almost never see anybody in the middle of the day that's me i'm the middle of the day you're the middle of the day you're you're now the you're the (laughs) new one you're the new category now yeah i'm the new category covid has created a brand new category of creative now it's the people who do it in the middle of the day exactly now i better live up to it can't change my schedule um (laughs) but yeah it's funny because so leonardo was kind of at the beginning of my film career i guess you could say it was really an exciting project it was like a lead role in it was the second season of a show that did really well in the first season i loved working with everyone on that show i'm still really good friends um with some of the actors today who've done really well you know ak was in queen's gambit which I think almost every single person watched and enjoyed and loved. And then um, Jonathan, who played the lead in Leonardo, he was in Bridgerton, which I didn't realize until I pressed play. I was like, wait, I know him. (laughs) So um, they've all gone on as well to have really incredible careers um, and so deserving of it. I mean, such, such, such nice guys. Colin Ryan as well, Divine and Flora Spencer Longhurst. Um, She's also just so lovely. They've all done really, really well, continue to do really well. But so I worked on that, which with this fictional character. Um, and then right before I moved to the US, I did a two year run of a theater production in South Africa called Shakespeare in Love. And my character there as well. So you've got Shakespeare, which is another, you know, you kind of say Shakespeare and Leonardo da Vinci. They kind of, for me, I hold them, you know, they're both hand in hand. very high esteem and my very high esteem. So they, um, but the character I played in Shakespeare in Love was also fictional, Viola de Lesseps. I was like, this is familiar. <laughs> so the same kind of preparation went into that role where it's it's fun. You can have a little bit of fun with the character. You can always have fun with the character, but especially if there's not the pressure of playing someone who actually did exist, 
there's a little bit more room for creativity. Yeah, you can you improv st- quite a bit more, yeah. Exactly. But you still want to give justice to the period, to the other characters, um, and to the circumstance of that character that existed for other living, real people. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, like I said, I, I love I love those kind of pieces because whether it's something completely fictional like Sherlock Holmes, which is done a million times. I was a big fan of Elementary. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that one on CBS with like Johnny Lee Miller and Lucy Liu. No, um, of course, you got the Benedict Cumberbatch version on BBC um, of Sherlock. Uh, things like Leonardo da Vinci and some of those history pieces. And, and over the years, you've had Da Vinci Code. You've had Da Vinci's Demons. You've had uh, Netflix had the Medici series for a while. Um, a lot of those are just so intriguing to me because the history buff in me comes out. I'm a big religious history buff too. Oh and, yeah. And you start diving under the layers for some of this stuff and you just get kind of stuck in a deep dive. It's like when you go on Wikipedia and you look up one thing and then you look up another and then you look up another and all of a sudden, like three hours later, you're like, wait, what time is it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You go to the references at the bottom. You're like, Oh, that's interesting. Click on that reference. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Click on that one. I'm even worse. I don't even make it to the bottom. I'm just like, Oh wait, you're talking about who? Who's that? Let me click on this guy. <laughs> but how is that tied into that? Oh, but what, who's this person? Yeah, yeah. And then you got like 18 yeah. tabs open on your la- on your browser or whatever, and you're like, wait, what? Yeah. See, you've missed your calling. I mean, I'm thinking investigator or historical investigator. <laughs> I thought about it when I was younger. I'm old now, but I thought about it when I was younger about like when I grew up, I kind of wanted to be like an FBI agent or something like that. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I, I always wanted to be an athlete or an FBI agent. And I did do acting for like the briefest of moments. I like got no further than like commercial shoots. And I was just like, I don't like the word no so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a word that means nothing to you if you're an actor. You're like, no, okay. Oh my cool. God, yeah. <laughs> looking for a yes. In, ho- in Hollywood, especially, you, you'll find out once things hopefully start opening back up. I hope you don't. I hope you don't, but. I'm sure you've been in this business now about a decade, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, if you get your hopes up for something, you got to temper it. And then sometimes you get the best roles out of nowhere. Mm. Like the ones you don't expect are all of a sudden somebody's knocking on your door. Hey, would you like to try this? And you learn very quickly, unless you're somebody like Johnny Depp or or Jim Carrey, you tend to say yes a lot. And sometimes it works out. Yeah. Um, you know, exactly. like I said, I mentioned I interviewed Donovan Carter and he was on the show Ballers with the Rock. And he had just come from a UCLA football career. And wow. he was doing like commercial work with UCLA. He hadn't really done acting, you know, this is something new for him. He was doing like some side jobs. And then he got, you know, his agent was like, Hey, do you want to try this? And he was like, All right, cool. And he went for the audition just because he's like, Why not? end up being the best move of his career so wow. I feel Why like that, I feel like a lot That's of actors great. I talk to it kind of works out that way yeah um, there's somebody you know it's funny you mentioned Leonardo and how many people are doing different things now it reminded me um there's another actor from New Zealand he's out in LA now too uh his name is Mike Ginn just like mine except he you know he say Americans yeah. like change everything he calls oh, it yeah. he does he butchers it he says that the name that that I hate I've hated my whole life where he says it's Gin. Gin. Uh, yeah. yeah and I'm just like it's gin, not you. gin. I'm not so a much. beverage. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Um, and it's funny now that my wife is taking up that battle now that she has my name too. She used oh, yeah. to be like, why are you getting mad about that? And now she knows. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but if you, he was on um, the Power Rangers RPM show back in the day and they filmed it in New Zealand. And that's how I kind of ended up on it. Kind of like how you ended up on Death Race and some other stuff because they came to South Africa. Yeah. If you look at that cast, almost half of them on that show have been in something you would know now oh yeah um, and the big name was uh Eki. i can't remember his last name but he was on the jessica jones and some of the defender stuff that they did oh wow um on netflix and mm-hmm. he was like he was the uh black guy with like the big hair and he was like he did a bunch of the bunch of the shows from one character he just did so well in jessica jones they kind of spun him off into all the shows um but that's where he started and like if you just look at the entire cast and like i know that person i know yeah. that person i know that person Mm-hmm. And it, it was just really cool. And it's kind of funny how, you know, we always talk about Kevin Bacon. It's a kind of fam- famous thing. Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can tie almost everybody into Kevin Bacon somehow. Yeah. But when you look at some, um, especially with digital media today, right? 
you know, you're talking about taking advantage of 2020 and taking advantage of digital and everything else. Because there's so many platforms now for an actor to do their craft, do web series, do comedy skits, do anything basically you want to do, do podcasts, do whatever. Yeah. I feel like there's so many avenues for one person to translate into another thing. And you're like, wait, I know that person. Mm-hmm. And it's so much easier to be seen. I think it's a needle in the haystack. Don't get me wrong. But that too. I, think, I, I think it's definitely to your advantage if you can take it, if you can take it and do yeah. what you want to do with it. Yeah, I think there's so many platforms to be able to create, um, you know, and that concept of waiting for your agent to call you because of production shooting and there's a role in it that you might fit and, you know, you might get the audition and you might get there and there might be another 20 girls with the same kind of profile and then you might get narrowed down to the callback and then you might get narrowed down to another callback and then you might book the job you know, that kind of process obviously still exists. And it's really exciting. It is exhilarating. I mean, when it all happens and it all kind of goes your way and all the dominoes kind of like fall and this like beautiful synchronicity, it's exciting. But there's also now, as you said, with um, all these different platforms, so much room to create. Even like TikTok. I haven't gotten into TikTok yet. I'm like, I can't take on another thing right now. But I look at- Avoid the addiction. A big part it? Avoid the addiction. I will. I'm avoiding it. I'm not not going there. But I look at like my niece. She's got a TikTok account and her and her friends, you know, they get together, they choreograph little dances and they put, it's a way for them to create. And I just go, how great, you know, that they've got a platform to create. I yeah, just it's like, it's like when YouTube first came out. <laughs> yeah, it's like when YouTube first came out. And, uh-huh, exactly. and now you got all these YouTube creators and, and TikTok's kind of doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Anytime there's a new platform for somebody to be creative, it's awesome. I, I, I can't personally sit there and do all these dances and stuff. And, <laughs> and, and my wife does some of the funny skit stuff. And oh, yeah. I, I see some of the other, my friends and stuff doing some stuff and I, more power to them. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of like a TikTok stalker. Like I'll watch all the videos and, and I'll like them and I think they're cool but I'm not, I'm not going to do it myself. Yeah. Like I can't, well, I can't take on another thing. I'm like, not right now, maybe 2022. <laughs> if it's still around. If it's still around. Exactly. What's they threaten to that? shut it down like every other month. Bad. Yeah. Big about it. They threaten to shut it down like every other month. So we'll see. Uh, oh yeah. That's also true. Oh gosh. So let's get back to acting for a little bit. We <laughs> That's one thing I love about this show. I get so sidetracked sometimes. Uh, it's um, good, such a good chat. And we didn't have this before. Last time you, you interviewed me with really like, great questions. Here's, here's the questions. Answer them. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah. And that was that. This is great. This is like chat and yeah, it's awesome. It's one of those reasons why I constantly say this is a conversation, not an interview. Yeah, um, exactly. I kind of stole it from Joe Rogan a little bit. I sit there and I watch his show and he sits there and you may start with a couple questions that you want to know, or you mm-hmm. may guide it back to a couple questions you want to know. You know, you're talking about, you know, doing your podcast and some of the things that you're kind of like getting better at doing and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those situations. And by the way, I'm sorry, the podcast is called the U effect. It's uh, Roxanne and uh, Nick Kokos. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would definitely include the links to iTunes and all the other things. So you can find her show. Um, It's all about self-motivation, getting better, improving yourself um, and, and great stories to kind of inspire you that accurate. Yeah. That is 100% accurate. Thank you. I'm going to take that sound bite and make it our trailer for the podcast page. <laughs> there you go. Just give me credit. Yeah. Um, give me I the will. link. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's all about the conversation and it's all about being able to just talk to people you can't talk to every day. Mm-hmm. Like me and you have, you know, I followed you on social media for years since our interview. And I obviously keep track with some of the things you're doing. But it's a lot different when I could sit there and hang out with you and talk to you for an hour. And completely, like, yeah. I didn't know a lot of stuff about what you're working on now until yeah. we started talking again. And you sent me some of the information, and I was like, mm-hmm. now I'm like completely intrigued because I do kind of know you a little bit, maybe not as a person as much, but I know your history. I know your, you know, your work history and stuff like that. And you've done stuff I've been interested in before. So, and I'm always one person that likes self improvement and like enjoying hearing other people tell their stories that you can kind of find inspiration from you might not connect with everybody 
like there's some people that will connect you in a different way. Um, I yeah. don't know how familiar you are being out in California now. Um, there's somebody named Tim Ferriss, kind of world famous, but uh, did a lot of the four hour books and he did some other motivational stuff, Tools of Titan, does a lot oh, of yeah, business yeah. stuff. But he started doing a podcast a number of years ago. And I started listening to him. Some episodes, you kind of just, they're background noise. <laughs> While you're cooking. <laughs> yeah, basically. And driving somewhere. And then other episodes, you just can't stop listening because mm-hmm. somebody will connect with you. And I think that's the great thing yeah. about being able to do this show, being able to do the U Effect. Um, you get to talk to people. And maybe you're not the best, most professional uh, podcaster in the world when when you start and you just keep you try to get better you that's the whole thing like with acting you try to improve you try to improve you try to get better every yeah. time yeah and so it's well, a great experience yeah and I want to I want to thank you for that because even you know going back to the first written interview that you did with me I think the fact that you give people a platform to share their stories that is such an incredible thing that can really be commended because people I mean it's kind of it's a it's a twofold kind of thing. So by letting people share their stories, you let them feel good about themselves. I mean, I'm often gonna leave this interview going, woohoo, I feel so cool. I just had such a great interview <laughs> with Mike. And you, yeah, you know, it it does. Like it put definitely adds a spring to my step for the day or for the week, or you know, um, and at the same time, hopefully if it's a good conversation, as you said, you know, and it's flowing both ways, hopefully you get something out of it as well, whether it's a smile on your face or, you know, maybe you think about something later on in the day and then hopefully to everyone listening as well, they also might get something out of it, whether it's like just motivation or something that was encouraging to them to hear or just entertaining, you know, um, a way to like break away from whatever's happening in their life that day or for that hour or 40 minute um, interview or conversation, I should say. So it's, it's really, I think what you're doing and you've stuck with it through, for all these years, giving people a platform to share their story. And that's something that really is very, very important. Stuck with it, more like come back to it. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I've, take, I've taken some hiatuses too. Yeah. Um, real, the real world <laughs> tends to get in, get in the way sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely been a passion. And mm-hmm. I think with anything, if, if you care about it, you'll find ways to get better at it. So yeah, hopefully yeah. I'm doing that justice. Um, I definitely appreciate the kind words. Uh, when you when you do stuff like this, what do you get out of it when you interview and do some of these podcasts? Yeah, well, I think what I get out of it, I mean, linking it back to the U effect is the fact that sometimes simple is all that's needed. And you said something quite similar. You said, don't, correct me if I'm wrong, you said, don't let perfection get in the way of good. Yeah, don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. Yes. Okay. So don't let the perfect be the enemy of good. And I think that resonates and that kind of, that goes further into our everyday actions. Like how often do we stop doing something that's good because we think, oh, maybe it's too small an action or it's not going to have a big enough impact or going to really help one person. What good is that going to do when I could maybe focus this energy on like a bigger project that then maybe in like, a year's time or a few months time can help more people like for now I'm not going to focus I'm just going to put my focus here so that in the future I can focus on more people or I think we so often stop ourselves from doing good because we want the impact to be bigger we want it to be perfect so with the U effect that is the point that myself and Nick Kokos um, are trying to highlight is it's simple conversations around big or small actions that have impact And that it's not about like how much you can give. It's not about the size of what you're giving, but it's about how you can positively impact others through actions that are, yeah, as I said, small or big. So having the discussions on the U effect highlight that, but it really encourages me just as a host, like speaking to guests or even just the conversations that I have with Nick on the episodes where we don't have guests I then take that after that, like we do short 15 minute episodes. We try and keep them at 15 minutes. Um, It kind of just makes me conscious about it. And then I try and take that and I put it into my everyday practice. So like every person I interact with is an opportunity to place your focus on someone else other than yourself or to give them an opportunity to speak. So it's like, you don't just need a podcast to give a person an opportunity to share their story. You know, you could be, 
waiting for a bus and you can give that person that you're standing next to an opportunity to share their story or having your groceries being put into a bag for you and just chatting to the person who's checking you out, um, checking out your groceries at the, um, at the till. So that's been the thing that I've really gained out of doing the podcast. And it's a concept that I kind of know it's not preachy. Like that's one thing I've read. Not sorry sorry to interrupt. Did that kind of like, which came first? Did that spin off into the get giver uh, website that you have, or did that come first? Good question. So, um, or they kind of go together. They kind of go together. I mean, the get giver, the year effect did come first. So the year effect was actually established in 24, uh, sorry, 2014 uh, with Nick Kokus and it was um, an NGO and he's actually gone out and worked on some incredible projects under the year effect umbrella. And that's like building schools in Burkina Faso in, in um, Africa and okay. really incredible, incredible outreach programs that have created huge impact um for tons of people that's then trickled down into more people like you talk about that the 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 ripple effect kind of thing um but you know not everyone can put together a project to build a school in a country or in a in a impoverished community you know not everyone has the means to fund um a big project like that so then what, do we just sit there and wait until one day we do have the funds or we do have the means or we do have the connections? No, like every single day, no matter what you have to give, even if you think it's something small, it's maybe not small. Like, a, you know, a conversation that I have with a stranger that can really impact my life going forward. And that stranger n- might not even know it. You know, I might never even see that stranger again, but it, they impacted me. So it's, that's what we're trying to kind of highlight with the U effect. And then the get giver, um, nutrition's always been something that's been really um, a big interest of mine. Um, and I had a blog a couple of years ago called The Banting Blondes, along with my friend Julia. And it was yeah, all, I remember that. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was around the same time that we did the, the interview. And it was simple. It was just like, I like making healthy food. So I would take a photo of it and post the recipe on Instagram and Facebook. And we harnessed this really great following in a short amount of time. We got to like 20,000 likes on Facebook and Instagram. Back then we got built to like 6,000, which back then was like, whoa, this this is going well. This is going well. That's about Um, where I capped off. And then it just, I couldn't get over that hump. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I know. Right. Um, I don't don't, don't look like, I don't look like Kylie Jenner. So I couldn't get quite over over oh, 6,000, yeah? so. Oh, oh, gosh. Yeah, you see? Uh, so well, sadly, because... I think I'm down to like 5,800 or something now. So it's, Oh, it's, yeah. Oh, I'm horrible well, now. To be honest, I don't know. I'm just kind of looking at it as a platform to share because if we get caught up in like getting followers and I can't play that game, also because I'm not very good at playing that game. Like, I don't know how it works. <laughs> I look at it differently. I look at it from a business point of view. So I look at it yeah. like I just launched something – which people kind of, I guess, will come to know over the next month or so. Um, I've owned this brand Life and Times for a while. Um, it's it's spelled differently than the way uh, Jay-Z does it. Um, so it's like lifexTimes.com. Um, oh, yeah. Right now it just goes to DCXIV, but I just relaunched all the social media network for it. And it's kind of um, one of those things where I'm trying to build up the, rebuild the brand for a month or so so that I can then take the people that care about what we're doing as far as a brand and then offer them products, offer them, uh, we're going to be, it's going to be more of a shop in shopping situation and, a, and a, that kind of business. Amazing. But I'm still very much into society and culture and everything else. So mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting to see that revelation of how those kind of correspond, because what I'm working on now is kind of, building that influencer model to then expand into other business aspects. And so I look at it as a business. I look at it as you have to take the steps to kind of engage with people. Um, You don't want to spam them. You don't want to be creepy about it. You don't want to flood their DMS and, and, and private messages, but you, you do need to engage with people when you're a certain kind of business. And mine is all based on the internet, basically, whether it's my shows whether it's my writing, whether it's the stuff I've done in the past, it's always been based on the internet. So I think it's a little different. Um, When you're somebody like yourself who has also that, I hate to use the word, but kind of like mainstream broadcasting 
um, where you're, you're on film, you're on television. Uh, I think it's just a different, different world where your following kind of comes from, yes, the stuff you're doing online now, but it also comes from the stuff that, you know, people see you and, and they admire you. Exactly. Reason, so. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly how I look at it both ways as well. So you want to have that engagement and a voice. I think it's such a great platform to have a voice for your company, for your brand, um, especially if you're starting something new. So if people look you up, I mean, that's where do it's people kinda, It's kind of hard to sell something if nobody knows you exist. Exactly. And also so many people these days also want to know the voice of the company before they support something or the voice of the brand. So um, in that regard, I think it's a really, really valuable tool to kind of share that. Um, but that's exciting. I'm going to keep an eye out for your new project. It sounds super cool. Yeah, it's always been kind of like a passion project on the side, but it's also got some, you know, like, like we were talking about earlier, we're talking about 2020, learning something new, doing yeah. something new. It's a different revenue stream for my company. It's a different revenue stream for me. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just something different to do because for people that know me, um, you might know this or not, but I've been a bartender for 20 plus years, uh, going on 22 years, and my industry is wrecked from everything. Yeah. So I could, things, I live down in Florida now, and things are definitely more open down here than they are in other parts of the country. I just moved down from D.C., which is right now during the holidays, they just completely banned all indoor dining. I know you being out in L.A., you're very well aware of Same how thing, some yeah. of these major cities are just completely reshutting down because of COVID. Um, I'm in a real st tough position because I'm, I'm in favor of the safety. Obviously I've known people to pass away from COVID. I, I, I take it very seriously, but at the same time, if, then I'm not going to get on a political rant, but if the government doesn't step up to take, to help the people they're putting out of work, mm -hmm. then you're kind of stuck in a crossroads because you can't pay your bills. You can't take care of your family. Yeah. All in the name of safety. And at that point, then people stop caring about being safe because they just want to take care of their priorities exactly. um, yeah. in their day to day. And then you stop caring about your neighbor. And that, I think it's all become a very tough situation for everybody to be involved, especially in these major cities where you have, you know, LA is what, 8 million people, 7 million people, something like that. Um, in the entire area, uh, DC was 660,000 in the city, but like 3 million wow. in the immediate area. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. New York, 11 million people. And some of these epicenters are where people really are. So, you know, you're talking about being out in LA. You can't go down to the coffee shop anymore and sit there all day long and be on your laptop or whatever and get some work done outside. Yeah. Um, the world has just completely changed. And yeah. I, you know, you look at you, you don't have as many auditions. You talked about your MMA and uh, Muay Thai stuff you're doing now. They, they basically are doing it outdoors now and they're trying to find other ways but being 2020 and 2021 now i feel like you have to find every way to improve yourself and you know like i said life and time is just gonna be another channel for me another yeah. opportunity that's probably the best way to put it another opportunity yeah for me to grow you know i'm sitting there and i see the u effect and i got a chance to listen just a little bit of it because i just found out about it late um yeah. but that's my fault I'll yeah, take, no, no worries. Um, <laughs> honestly, you gave me gave me something to kind of get into this week, which I, I kind of appreciate. I always love finding new stuff. Um, and like you mentioned, they're only like 15, 16 minutes long, 18 minutes long. They're not long. So you can actually binge watch or binge listen to uh, quite a few of them. So I do like that. Um, and I'm kind of interested a little bit um, in the Together brand that you were kind of, uh, you mentioned uh, the social media um, Together. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm kind of jaded on it. I don't really know. I don't know. Like when you start a new social network, the 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 odds of, of picking up are kind of always hard. Yeah. Um, but I like the concept. I like the positivity to it. So I, I definitely um well, a I little bit interested in that. I love that you say that because that's something that definitely um I want to highlight with the together app which has been incredible. I just kind of go like life has the synchronicity to it. So the Together app, um, I heard about it before the pandemic began um, and before the lockdown began. And then I really started digging my teeth into it and just get being part, being brought in as part of the team, especially for um, the communication side, the messaging side, 
um, of the app. But, you know, it's, it's more, yes, there's a so social element to it, definitely. It's all about connectivity with others, communicating with others on this new platform. But more than that, it's a tool to kind of reroute us back to what we were before social media. So <laughs> it's almost... <laughs> So um, I'm old I and I don't even remember that anymore. A big about it? I said I'm old and I barely remember that anymore. Exactly. Was there a time? Because um, as we said, I mean, we've already highlighted all the benefits of social media, all the benefits of all these platforms like TikTok. I mean, the creative side that comes out of it, the connectivity side that comes out of it. You and I, you know, are connected and met through social media. So it's not, it definitely has so many um, perks and so many positive. I feel like you and I first connected over Twitter, I believe. Was it Twitter? Okay. Oh my gosh. And Twitter, to be honest, I haven't been on Twitter for a very long time. <laughs> I should probably log into that account again. But, Just log um, in to make sure you retweet this episode. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I'll do that. I'll do that. Um, but yeah, but it's with together, I kind of feel, wouldn't it be amazing if when we woke up in the morning, the first thought on, in our minds was someone else or the first thought in our mind was how can I help someone else today? Or oh my gosh, I just read yesterday on social media, whether it be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or together, this person is struggling with ABC. How can I help them with that today? Or how can I spend time, whether it's through actually, you know, getting out and actually physically helping them or picking up the phone and actually, you know, putting in that actual time and energy into that person. Or with the Together app, there's also the way that you can, whatever word you prefer, pray for, manifest for, send positive vibes, good energy um, through almost a gamification side where people can actually, they'll sit and they'll like hold on this beautiful like um, orb with a tree in the background and you're helping people grow their tree. So it's like a really beautiful interactive kind of aspect to the app. But um, when, when you see someone's done that for you, you can actually see how many seconds they've spent thinking of you. Um, with whatever you decided to post and it's just kind of a it can be self-gratifying yeah yeah and like, it's like it's a form completely, of validation completely it is but it's more than just this dopamine hit of yeah I'm getting likes I want more likes I want more likes I want more likes and you know it's more it's it's become a quantity game I feel like we're living in this world of like we might get two people comment on a post and go oh I just listened to your interview it inspired like this really beautiful comment but that's cool. It's nice. But you know what? That other post when I got 50 comments with people posting an emoji or a thumbs up or a heart sign or whatever, that made me feel better. Or that other post where I got tons of likes, that made me feel better than this post where I only got maybe two nice comments and 50 likes or 20 likes. Or So we, we're kind of trained to go, you know, you scroll through social media, you scroll, you like, you scroll, you like, and you feel like you've kind of done your your duty for the day as a friend or a family member but at the end of the day do we even remember all the posts that we've liked or do we remember are we taking time we're we taking time to just slow down like we I used get in to trouble do. for that sometimes yeah exactly like, my do. wife would be like hey you saw that post I put today and I was like I liked it right <laughs> but yeah. I, really, I might not remember it like but you know it's important to her that I liked it but at the same time then when she comes back to like try to talk to me about it and I'm like right, what post let me pull out my phone while I'm talking to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> but you're like trying to play catch up because you, like you said, you, you, you get stuck in this, co this constant like rotation of, of like, move on, like, move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually something you'll love, but you know. Yeah. And then on the other side, a lot of the time we're just posting our accolades, you know, and expecting validations for our accolades it's like this is all the good things that's happening which is great I'm like a big proponent and I'm sure you know this with my social media I love sharing positivity <laughs> that, that buzzword to be like oh positivity but I really I like I think there's a lot of power in sharing right now we need more of that so don't feel bad about that yeah. okay thank you thank you um yeah there's a lot of power in sharing positive stories whether it's encouraging someone else or inspiring someone else motivating all those other buzzwords it's real easy to be negative um, right now it's hard to be positive so it is yeah yeah it is you've got to dig deep you know to find something and no matter how small it is but something to be positive about but i also think there's a lot of power in being real and being open and a little 100%. bit more vulnerable and sharing the realities you know and it's hard to do especially like 
for me, I've kind of been conditioned and trained, especially, you know, with previous interviews that I've done in the past where it's always been like, I want to share all the good things that are happening, especially as an actor, you like, you want to come across as if like, everything's going so well, my career is going so well, there's not a cloudy day in sight. Um, yeah, protect but I think your brain. That, yeah, exactly. And I think it, it takes a lot to kind of swallow your pride or like put your ego aside and go, you know what, this is the reality of it. And this is my story. And if the end of the story, there's like a nice positive message and glimmer of hope and of this is how I made it through, then great. And if there isn't, I think that's also fine. I think people are allowed to share their stories if they're still trying to figure things out and work things out. Because for a lot of people, they haven't found that silver lining yet or they haven't found the the full stop to this terrible story with like a happy ending. They're still on the journey of hopefully getting there. And if we have in our minds this constant thing of I can only give to others or I can only put my focus on others when I have sorted everything out my side, then, oh my gosh, we're going to be waiting our whole lives because I, I really don't think, I mean, I don't know, maybe there is someone out there, but I think we're all struggling with something in our lives. I don't know one person who isn't, who's got everything sorted, whether it's financial relationships, family, you know, work, you know, environment, we're all struggling with something. And I think sometimes being a little bit more real with each other, having real conversations like we're having right now, I think a lot of growth and development. I think people connect with it more too. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. So that's kind of the point of the together app. It's just creating a space where we can kind of reroute ourselves back to real authentic connection. And then hopefully that carries through to the rest of your life and the rest of the rest of your day. So you spend a little time of the app, it gets you out of your head and then you go, okay, how can I implement this into my everyday life? Let me ask you this, because um, I just thought of this. I know you're more on the communications messaging side of the app, but are you, are you privy to this? Is there any plans to bring the app more to like a desktop type style model? So if somebody is sitting there at a coffee shop logging in or at home, you know, or get to the office and they, they go and log on their computers, like the way they do Facebook now, it's like one of the first things they opened up or Instagram or Twitter. Mm -hmm. Is there plans to expand to, because right now it's only available, I believe, via, via apps. Is there yeah. any plans to expand to a desktop version? Um, I think definitely that is something Make it more that, accessible. that they're looking at. Yeah, I'm not on the development side of it, but um, I think that that is something that Put they're that in looking at. in the suggestion at. box. Yeah, and this is, exactly. And also, again, you know, how many people feel kind of, there are still a lot of people that feel a little bit, it's daunting almost to have everything on your phone. Some people still love an email. They love a desktop. They love a laptop. I so, would go a step further and say it's actually um, a disadvantage to not have something people can see in action before they buy. So yeah. if you have to download an app to to see how the how it works, yeah. instead of just being able to like log on and be like, or just go to a desktop and be like, oh, okay, I see how other people are using it. Like you can look at Twitter without actually being signed into Twitter, right? Uh -huh, like you yeah. can go on somebody's page or profile and be like, oh, this is what they're talking about. Um, Facebook's a little more locked down. Instagram, you don't have to have an account to see what's, what people are posting. Um, it's one of those things where if you're not involved into it, TikTok does it. TikTok, you can go on their website and look at other people's TikToks. You, you don't necessarily have to have an account. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where if you're, not sure what something is, whether it's completely legitimate or completely spammy. You don't know, right? How are they going to use your information when you sign in and sign up? Like there's there's a lot of information and issues, I think, with blind trust, mm -hmm. especially in the internet in 2021. There is, <laughs> yeah. And my friends always mock me for that. They're like, Roxanne, just click accept. No one reads the terms and conditions. I'm like, I do. I read there every single <laughs> thing yeah. in those terms and conditions. If there's something that I don't like. I'm not going to download it. But I think that you bring up a really, really good point. Um, so yes, suggestion box that is going in the suggestion box for sure. Yeah, it's just one of those things. Like you talk about terms and conditions. If you, you know, have, me personally, I never really put anything online that I don't care if it gets out. Um, yeah, yeah. You mm -hmm. don't see pictures of my daughter very often. Once in a blue moon, you have to scroll really hard through my stuff to find 
one like that we may be like a pumpkin patch or something but yeah you don't really see pictures of my daughter because i feel like a i think it's more up to my wife to kind of share some stuff like that because she's more private than i am anyway i'm the more public everything's yeah. out there type person so you can't see my wife's stuff unless you like you know my wife mm-hmm. um so she posted then it's a little bit safer an environment but me like i'm not going to put stuff online that i don't care if people find out yeah and so the terms and conditions don't really necessarily apply to someone like me. Cause if you take my data and you take my, my information and use it, you're not going to get much out of it. Yeah. It's like, good luck. Have fun. It's yeah. Fun. You're not going to find my <laughs> phone number on, on a website. If you do, it's a business line. It's not mine. Yeah. Um, it's something I probably check a voicemail for. It's not even like direct connect. Uh, you may see my email, but that to me is very impersonal. Um, anybody can go MG at one of my websites and, and get in touch with me. I have, I love actually interacting with people. Go ahead, spam me. I don't care. Um, But I just feel like if you don't know what you're getting into, a lot of people, especially I feel like people like you are getting more conscious about what they're signing up for. Mm -hmm. I just think that's a tougher hill to climb. Yeah. And I think, I think that is nice to have, you know, the desktop version, as you said, where people can kind of get a preview without having to download something new. Um. And then and even if you are. offer a membership version later where people can get more value, there's mm-hmm. even another business model right there too. Yeah, you should get into app development. I used Seriously? to, I, I don't have the patience. <laughs> yeah. if, if somebody wants to put me on a board of directors and pay me, then sure. Then um, exactly, but, yeah. But, but other than that, I don't. Paycheck involved, then yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, do some, I'll do some consulting, but uh, yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's, it really has been a really great um, project to work on. And it all kind of coincides with the U effect, with the get giver. So the get giver, um, as I was saying earlier, with the nutrition side of things, it's that's always been an interest of mine. So it's the same kind of concept of, you know, focusing on others, but it's with a more health and nutrition focus. Um, whereas the U effect and the get giver is everyday interaction not necessarily around food or health or physical. Yeah, it's all about empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it's yourself or somebody else. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, I think that's all amazing. And uh, I won't take too much more time because we've already been like, just like I said, conversations <laughs> yeah, can get away from you. Um, and we've already, I've already taken up an hour of your time, but I do have a couple more questions and I'll let you get out of here. Yeah. Um, and I will definitely put a hundred percent, all those show notes, uh, links to those show notes. Um, Thanks, so everybody man. can get in touch, uh, follow what Roxanne's doing, follow um, the Get Giver, the U Effect uh, together and some of the other projects she's working on. And obviously, you know, nothing's really too much of a secret anymore. So, you know, the film projects when they come up, like people are like, oh, I know this person's working on this. Yeah. Um, Internet Movie Database makes that a little too easily accessible. That used to be a secret. Now, like yeah, it used to be a secret. Now you're like, oh, okay, yeah, fine. I was, re- I was reading our old interview um, a couple of days ago, getting kind of refreshed and it's kind of funny because I was talking about how you kind of been in a lot of period pieces, but you you did kind of bounce into another action movie right after Death Race. You did uh, the um, bordering, bordering on bad behavior role. And, yes. and that was like kind of a, like a military style action like style movie. And yes. that was actually it's funny because I believe the way I kind of read it and maybe I, I, it wasn't a secret, but you kind of were like, well, I'm kind of working on this, but I don't want to talk about it. I can't talk about it yet. Because you hadn't done, you hadn't filmed it yet, I don't believe, uh, when we did the first interview. So that, oh, okay. that was that timing. Okay. Yeah. 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 It was right before you popped into that one, 2014. Yeah. Um, and then that movie, came, or maybe you filmed it, but I guess it hadn't come out yet. It might have been that. Yeah. I'm trying because to. I'm trying I believe to we talked in like. My memory files. <laughs> yeah. Because I think we talked at the end of 2014. It might have been like November or something like that. Mm-hmm. So I believe it, you had already filmed it, but it just hadn't come out. Um, but my question, I guess, is, what do you prefer doing? Like what, now that you're out in LA now, you know, I believe that you probably would be open to a few different types of roles, but what, like, what kind of role are you looking to get into to kind of expand who you are? Yeah, good question. And that's something, it's a question that comes up a lot in LA. People really do want to know. I mean, there's so many actors. So it's, it's like, what are you, you know, what's your speciality? It's kind what of hard are you to typecast prefer? you because you've done different things. A big pattern? It's kind of hard to typecast you because you've done different things. You've done the period pieces, you've done the action, it's done, you know, you've done drama. So, which in a way, 
I love, and that was something that I, it was a conscious decision. I always liked working on different projects with different, um, a different vibe to it or genre. But in another way, it does create a little bit of confusion, especially when you enter the acting scene in the US where there are so many actors. When you walk into a room, a casting director does not, they really, there's got to be a little bit of intrigue. There needs to be a little bit of like, oh, who's this person or something interesting about them. But they don't have the time to sit and figure out what kind of an actor you are or what you're going to bring to the part or what it is that makes you special and stand apart um, from others. And that's something that I've learned. Whereas in South Africa, because there are a handful of actors and a handful of jobs shooting there, you want to be able to work on every single job that is possibly shooting in South Africa, whether it's local or international. So they'll say, there's a musical shooting in South Africa. Great, I can tap dance, I can sing. I went to musical theater school for university. <laughs> then they'll be like, okay, there's an action movie. Great, I've been doing Muay Thai for six years with two-time world champion, Quentin Jong. And you know, I actually host self-defense seminars and I can do fight choreography. And then they'll move on to say, you know, so you kind of want to make yourself bookable for everything that comes your way whereas in LA they're like no 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 if I want an action girl I'm gonna go to that girl who just focuses on action if I want a peria piece you know um damsel then I'm gonna go to that woman who you know specializes in that or who has you know a, a period piece background or Shakespearean training or so it's been something that I've really had to wrestle with because I've kind of taken a lot of pride in being, you know, uh, able to do tool. everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and it's something, looking at it, I do love the action side of things, especially with the Muay Thai training. I would love to work on more jobs um, that incorporate that. It's something that's really exciting for me. Um, and then I do love the period pieces. I really, really do. I res really resonate to those roles and those jobs and just being really transported into another era. Um, so I still don't have an answer, unfortunately. <laughs> Talk about tap dancing. Wow. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I wasn't even joking. I was being dead serious. <laughs> tap dance. You should be a politician. There's a whole other career field right there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so do you, so you really think that maybe and I kind of see it twofold too, but do you think like there's more work for people that are in a certain niche than people that do actually bounce around because they know like what to get out of certain people? Yeah, I think, I think that it can definitely work in your favor. Again, I really don't think there's a silver bullet. I really, and if there is, I have not found it yet. So if someone has a silver bullet, please <laughs> send me a link to it. But um, I, I think that there's so many ways to go about it. But if there's one thing that you feel passionate about, I mean, for anyone in the creative industry or, you know, actors, you know, possibly listening, I think if there's something you feel passionate about, don't worry about having to be a jack of all trades. You don't have to, you can just find, you can find success in focusing on one thing and really honing and toning that one thing. And that's fine. Um, and you look at a lot of successful actors a lot of the actors that I aspire to and, you know, have followed their careers, it's always been the actors with the versatile role choices and um, versatile characters. But a lot of the six, most successful actors are the actors who have been quote unquote typecast or they get booked because they will bring that certain blah. Casting director to, saw them in one thing that was similar to what they're doing. So they brought them in for the next project. And Exactly. All the producers go, people love that guy. And they love him for that quality. So if I bring him in on that project, he better show that quality because that's what's going to sell the tickets to watch the show or to watch the film. So, yeah, there's a, there's um, works both ways, I guess. Well, Roxanne, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I won't take up too much more of your time. Uh, just do me a favor real quick for people that uh, will only watch the video or listen to the audio and won't actually yeah. read the show notes. Uh, tell everybody where they can find everything that you're uh, working on right now. Yeah, so for the performance, the acting um, side of things, that would be my Instagram and Facebook, which is my name, Roxanne Hayward, R-O-X-A-N-E, and then Hayward, H-A-Y-W-A-R-D, uh, which in America, I have to say Hayward. I can't say Hayward anymore because then people spell it incorrectly. <laughs> but to re-pronounce like, my surname. spell it like Wood or something like that? They spell, yeah, W-O-O-D instead of A-R-D, so it's Hayward. Um, and then the get giver for anyone interested in overall like health 
nutrition, um, and it, it's much more than physical health as well. It's also the mental, emotional, spiritual side of things. That would be the get giver. Um, so the get giver, all one word, um, the separate word, get giver, Facebook, and then Instagram's at the get giver. Together is spelt for the app is 2GTHR. Um, and that's the Together app. And then the U effect, spelled with an E effect, is the podcast. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Roxanne, it's been a pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the Certified Podcast. Thank you for listening and watching. And uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good Thanks, one. Mike.